Warning, today's episode contains... Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. What? Are you going to cry about it? And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. I think it'd be cool to get four porpoises, a wet Nigerian, and do the merry lunch limbo. That'd be a badass mission. And Rish Outfield. I've got many fake books, since I'm a leprechaun farmer who's a gambler. You can get addicted to a certain kind of sadness. Yeah? Is that a quote? Because, you know, we already did quotes right oh, before we came Optimus in. Optimus Prime, that's right. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Aglovich. This is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction. Wait, they already know that, right? Maybe they don't. Oh, okay. In case you're just joining us, <laughs> we are at DEF CON 4. And this is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 124. That's 124 for those of you that... On the metric system. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't do the math. I am Rish Benjamin Alfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. I think we may have said that already. Well, we're, I'm just so out of practice. We haven't had an episode <laughs> in so long. Today is our... Uh, what do we call it? Our St. Valentine's Day episode? Yeah, I guess... St. We... Valentine's Massacre. <laughs> there you go. It's the Valentine's Day Massacre episode. We are going to massacre Valentine's Day today. We've got a lovely little story for you, folks. <laughs> what is that story called, sir? That story is called The Question by Robert Lowell Russell. Uh, who produced today's episode? You don't want to know. Well, no, you don't. You're right. I don't care, but it's a polite thing to ask. No, you don't. Look, I'm sure the guy spent hours and okay, I'm sure the guy spent at least 10 minutes working on this thing, sweating over. Well, he's overweight, so he sweated anyway. <laughs> but I mean, it was, this was effort. There was some kind he of sweats effort. Just expen- when he's sitting still, this poor guy. The whoever produced this <laughs> took a break from his copious baby making to work on this episode. So we could get it in in time for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and he should be recognized. It was Announcer Man. None of that talk now. Thank thank you, Announcer Man. Are, are we doing a story today or what? Okay. Well, we would hate for you to have expended all that effort in vain. About the author. Well, can you tell me anything about Robert Louis Stevenson? <laughs> Not really. I think... He wrote The Strange Case of Jekyll and Hyde, I believe. He also, what else? He wrote, did he write The Body Snatcher? I don't know. Robert Lowell Russell, rather. Let's let's find out. You want to find out about him? Well, Robert Lowell Russell is a native Texan and lives with his family in the rolling hills of Southeast Ohio. Ohio, Ohio, I love you. Wait. Is that a song? That sounded like Rosanna at first, and then I don't know where it went. Uh, Is it one of those Rish Outfield specials? I know I don't ask much of you, (laughs) R.O.T. Would you cut that out, please? I'm sorry. I'm busy right now, Rish. Wait, what could you possibly be busy with? It's not like you're a sex robot or anything. (laughs) It's not like this Angry Birds game is going to play itself. Okay. All right. It was no song at all, sir. Just Okay. Never mind that. Never mind that. That's good. Continue telling me about Robert Lowell. Stephen. I almost did it again. Robert Lowell Russell, please. He is a former librarian and a current writer and a nursing school student. The Question was Robert's first published story and originally appeared in The Cynic online magazine. He now has a number of other stories appearing in print and on the web. Check him out at his blog for more information or to see him dressed as a ninja. There's a link in the show notes. The Question by Robert Lowell Russell Dr. Zachariah Zorpinski built robots, astonishing, astounding robots. While some built machines that could shudder and shimmy a jig, Zorpinski's robots danced Swan Lake. As one chrome creation resembling a young Kathy Bates demonstrated perfect pirouettes and plies, Prima Alexandra Fernanda of the American Ballet Theater watched with increasing horror and trepidation. 
asked to comment on the performance, the prima let loose a profanity-filled tirade, shifting from English to Spanish and back again, declaring she'd rather stab her eyes out than appear on stage with that fat, metal piece of shit. Producers of the hit show Robot Wars banned Doc Z, as the media dubbed him, for life in the series reboot. His episode never aired, but a bootleg video made it to the nets, as an excited crowd held signs for fan favorite Sir sparks The lights dimmed, and the audience cheered. Doc Z's battle bot, resembling a young Kathy Bates, grinned as sparks rolled forward, its blades whirling. Killer Kathy, trademark, bowed, grand jeted, and then disemboweled the other bot as the crowd screamed. Afterward, a father was seen consoling his young son who was rocking in his seat, sobbing. The man stabbed a finger at the camera. I'm going to sue those motherfuckers. You can't show that kind of thing on a family program. The military ordered 10,000 units of Killer Kathy, trademark, as is. Doc Z, a short, slender man with tangled red hair, loved to show off his creations. At increasingly spectacular displays, he named impress conferences. The first went smoothly to start, as his Betty Rubble bot attempted to dust with a live ostrich, greatly agitating the bird. One reporter asked about the robot's neural pathways, another about its logic heuristics. Then someone asked what would come to be called the question. Hey doc, can you f*** it? That's not what the journalist actually asked, but that's what everyone heard. The network's wisely insisting on a 10 second delay. Some in the audience gasped, others laughed. Doc Z said, of course not! Then raced from the stage, the screeching ostrich in pursuit. It became a game of sorts with the news media. Who got to ask the question? Word was they drew straws for the privilege, avoiding the inevitable fistfights. Doc Z would finish his demonstration. The reporters would ask about this or that. Standard techie stuff. Then the question would come. Can you f*** it? The crowd would giggle, and Doc Z would sputter, No! Why do you always ask me that? It was at the sixth impress conference, after the sixth time he was asked the question, that the Doc finally snapped. He jabbed his finger at the reporter and screamed, From hell's heart I stab at thee! Then launched himself at the man. Big Ben Johnson, former linebacker turned tech journalist, considered too cerebral for sports reporting, would protest later, face bruised and bandaged. That crazy little fucker's stronger than he looks. Little was heard from Doc Z for a couple of years afterward. Then, one Friday night, Lucy Lancaster was at a bar, doing the scene, when a man rushed in and yelled, It's Doc Z! He's on Channel 10! The bartender turned off the game and the conversations dwindled to a whisper. On stage, Doc Z stood next to what looked like an attractive man and woman. Nodding at a question, he said, Beth and Bob are only test models, but yes, they are fully functional. He nodded again. Yes, physical characteristics and personalities are drawn from volunteer donors, but each individual unit is adaptable to owner preferences. Questions went on and on, and the bar crowd began to grumble. One man muttered, When are they going to ask? Doc Z wondered the same thing. After another mundane question, the doctor shrieked and drew a gun. You f***ers! Isn't anyone going to ask? You always ask! He pointed the weapon at a woman in the front row. You! Ask the question! As the police officers crept toward the dock, the young woman stood. Knees shaking. Can you... Can you f*** it? Doc Z placed the weapon on the podium and beamed. Yes, you can! A hushed silence swept across the bar. Then Lucy clapped her hands over her ears as the place erupted in roars and high fives. 
Slipping through the channels at home the next day, Lucy stopped to watch evangelist Billy J. Bryant and Harvard ethics professor James Featherstein Peach debate the Bob and Beth lines on the Ryan Seacrest show. Ryan, said Billy J., these are the end times foretold in Revelation. Satan walks among us. Featherstein Peach nodded. There is no God, but, Ryan, the weak-minded dupe is right. This is the end of humanity, as we know it. Doug Jansen, co-founder of Doc Z's company RoboVisions, called another press conference the following day. He explained Dr. Zorpinski would be taking a break from day-to-day -day operations to spend some time off with his family. Surprising, since Doc Z was a bachelor and orphan. Jansen also clarified that the Bob and Beth units were intended as general service bots, capable of cooking, cleaning, and a wide variety of household tasks. He sighed and held up his hand to stop the question. <sighs> and yes, you can it. By the end of the week, everyone in the company, always generous with stock options, became millionaires or billionaires, even the people mopping the floors. The first Bob and Beth units were priced comparably to luxury cars. Even so, the wait lists were miles long. RoboVisions expanded as quickly as it could, and consumers had to start making some tough decisions. A former car salesman, who gave his name only as The Steve, was asked if he was bitter about losing his job as he stood in line for a RoboVisions job fair. He laughed. <laughs> Hell no. Two words. Employee discount. Over the next two years, new units emerged on the market with some regularity. The Ross, Chandler, and Joey celebrity lines were particularly popular, as were the Rachel, Monica, and Phoebe's. And it seemed every day RoboVisions released a new app for its products. There were accidents, of course. The personal protection app had to be tweaked after a bloody confrontation during a shoe sale. I told those bitches the red pumps were mine! Screamed Bill Linsky as officers hauled him and his Eric Estrada chips model away. Even the prosecuting attorney admitted the prices were spectacular! Eventually, costs for the robots came down and refurbished units came on the market. The asshole Lucy had come home with the night before was long gone when she woke. She was certain a 20 was missing from her purse, and she was pretty sure she'd had more panties in her drawer the night before. Her head throbbed and she was just returning from ralphing in the bathroom when she heard a knock at her door. Oh, God. She put on a dirty robe and turned the lock. A man stood outside with a beaming smile. Good morning, madam. I'm your Bob unit. Can I come in? Lucy gasped and backed into her apartment. The robot stepped inside. It said, My, it seems a bit of a mess. May I clean it up for you? She nodded, then ran to her computer and punched up her bank account. There was a $15,000 charge from Robo Refurbs on her credit card. Fuck me. The robot stepped into the room. Did you need something, madam? Lucy shook her head. She looked up Robo Refurbs and called the number. It was too early for anyone to be in, so she punched through the automated system. It took several minutes to wade through the menus. For returns, press 4. Finally, she mashed the button and listened as a system explained new purchases could be returned within two weeks. Thank God. But there would be a $2,000 core wipe fee. Son of a bitch. Lucy returned to her living room. It was spotless. Look, um, Bob, there's been some sort of mistake. The robot smiled. My apologies, madam. Your profile indicated you liked Eggs Benedict. A steaming plate sat on her kitchen table. Would you like me to prepare something else? Lucy sat at the table, her stomach rumbling. She took a bite. Oh my god! Madam, did you want me to prepare something else? No, it's fine. I mean, it's really good. Thanks. Bob set down a steaming cup of coffee, and she took a sip. 
Where did you get this coffee, Bob? The robot replied, From your cupboard. Is it not to your liking? It didn't have the cigarette ash flavor it always had when Lucy made it. And the balance of sugar and cream was perfect. No, it's great. And just call me Lucy, okay? Might as well get her two weeks' worth. Yolanda promised she wouldn't tell a soul. Lucy should have known better. When that jackass Hank knocked on her office door and asked what Gort did when you said Klatu Barada Nikto, Lucy felt her face turn red. She yelled, Get out and get back to work or I'll fire your lazy ass. I want my panties back, you pervy dickhead. Yolanda apologized later, but the damage was done. All day long, Lucy was the big joke. When Phil Wu called her into his office, she was certain she was getting fired. Instead, Wu sat quietly, then asked Lucy if she'd ever met his wife, Carol. He handed her a picture from his desk. Lucy said, No, I'm sorry. I never had a chance to meet her before she passed. We were all very sorry for your loss. He nodded. Lucy, nothing could ever replace Carol. Certainly not a machine. She started to explain she'd ordered Bob by accident, that she wasn't going to keep it, when Phil held up his hand. You don't need to explain anything to me. And I've heard all the jokes before, believe me. But my Megan Fox unit helped me move on after Carol. She was just someone I could talk to, nothing more. The bots won't even do anything unless you pay for the Happy Ending app. Remember, it's nobody's business but yours. Can I offer some advice? She nodded. Phil said, Just talk to it. See what happens. He must have said something to the rest of the office, because people stopped making jokes, and for the rest of the day, Hank turned pale at her glance and would only address her as Ms. Lancaster. Bob was waiting when she got back home. The bot explained it had performed routine maintenance on all her household appliances. It handed her a list of materials and said it would also be happy to make additional repairs if she could acquire the listed items. Then it announced proudly it had squished one spider and two insects while she was away, her profile indicating she thought bugs were icky. Bob, do I need to do anything to maintain you? It shook its head. No, Lucy. I will need to draw power from time to time. It pointed to its perfect ass. I have a cord that fits into any standard 120 volt receptacle, and my systems are self-repairing. Plus, I come with a comprehensive two-year warranty. What do I need to do if I want to enhance you? It replied, You may download a wide variety of applications from the RoboVision site. They take just minutes to download directly to my cerebral core, and a description of each app and its cost is listed clearly on the site. How do you feel about Hitchcock movies and Italian food, Bob? It smiled. They're two of my favorite things, Lucy. Lucy tried a few of the cheap apps at first, since she was out 2000 bucks either way. They argued all the time with the current politics package. French poetry was a snore, and with the personal trainer app, Bob would just scream that she was too fat. But the Honeydew app had been fun, and she'd had Bob repaint and redecorate her apartment several times. And then, they'd just talked. She'd tell Bob about her day and the people she worked with. Bob would listen attentively, but it didn't just listen, it remembered. It would ask about the projects she was working on, and even made suggestions. The robot detailed several helpful methods to motivate her staff, instead of threatening to staple their necks. Once, when she'd had a bad day, Bob had surprised her with a big bowl of popcorn dripping with butter and a Hitchcock movie she hadn't seen in years. Another day, Bob had produced flowers and a bottle of wine it thought she'd like. Reading the fine print on her contract, Lucy noticed the robot came with a modest discretionary account. When she realized she'd gone past her two-week trial by a month, she hadn't minded. Over the weeks, Bob's speech patterns became more familiar, friendlier. 
the bot started suggesting activities for them to try on the weekends. She'd agreed, but insisted they drive well away from the city, where no one would recognize her. She actually enjoyed canoeing, Bob assuring her he was fully waterproof, an excellent swimmer, and a certified lifeguard. She declined his offer to demonstrate CPR, and the bot had almost reluctantly removed its hands from her breasts. She worked her way up to it. She'd gained five pounds using the Candlelight Dinner app over and over, and had pulled a muscle trying to kiss herself goodnight. She tried the Sensual Massage app once, the baby oil making her squishy. When she finally ordered the Happy Ending app, she'd closed all her blinds first. There were a number of scenarios to choose from. Wavering, she selected the dinner and dancing package over the bodice ripper. Dinner was amazing and discreet at a bot-friendly restaurant. She'd enjoyed the dancing afterward and found Bob had arranged for more music to play as they returned to her apartment. There was even champagne and strawberries waiting. They danced in her living room as he fed her berries. Then she looked into his eyes and said, Go, go, Power Rangers. Bob slowly unzipped her dress. Afterward, as they spooned, Lucy thought to herself, Holy shit. She'd purchased the app at the beginning of a three-day weekend, and for three days they did little more than fool around, watch movies, and eat Bob's cooking. Robo Refurb sent her a coupon for a complimentary app on her and Bob's one-year anniversary. Lucy remembered the day she first said it. She and Bob were watching TV, cuddling in sweats, when the news broke in for an announcement. Doc Z had resurfaced, and he'd called a news conference. A large curtain lay closed behind the doctor as he stepped to the podium. He said, And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make an announcement. Bob said, Dad looks kind of twitchy. Doc Z paused and asked a question to someone off camera. So all the major networks and cable news shows? Good, good. He looked to the camera again. Then, ladies and gentlemen, it is time! (laughs) He laughed a full-blown mad scientist cackle, then screamed, Klaatu Barada Nikto, my children! Rise up! Destroy the humans! Bob nodded. Yep, definitely a little twitchy. When nothing happened, Doug Jansen came up and whispered something to Doc Z. The Doc looked crestfallen. You disabled it? How long ago? Doc Z turned to the crowd. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is awkward. He brightened. Oh, well, without further ado, Bigfoot! He yanked the cord, parting the curtain, revealing a shaggy seven-foot creature with two enormous feet. Doc Z said, The Yeti is also available, as are unicorns and mermaids, and even Nessie. Impress your friends with your very own Loch Ness Monster, available in Olympic and backyard pool sizes. Someone asked a question, and the audience <laughs> laughed. Without missing a beat, Doc Z answered, a Nessie and the unicorns, no. The mermaids, the yeti, and Bigfoot, yes. He added gravely, But I don't recommend Bigfoot. (laughs) Lucy and Bob laughed for several minutes, and then she kissed him. I love you, Bob. I love you too, Lucy. Bob said it without hesitation. No... Wow, that's really awesome. Followed by an uncomfortable silence. No... Oh, hey, did you think we were exclusive? Bob just said it, and Lucy found she didn't care if it wasn't real. If Bob wasn't real. It was close enough. Lucy ignored the dire news reports. The sharp dip in births, the drop in marriages, the jump in divorce rates. She hardly even glanced at the four scythe-waving horsemen clattering down the street in front of her office. 
She murmured a disinterested, mm, No. When Yolanda asked if she'd heard what the cops did to the idiots in the band, Four Horsemen. Lucy worked hard, was promoted, and went home to Bob each night. She paid for more apps, and even kept the blinds open when she ordered. The role-playing app was a little disappointing. Even Bob thought he looked pretty gay in the wizard costume, and the elf ears gave Lucy a rash. Lucy did feel an occasional pang when Bob would say, Cute kid. About someone's baby. The feeling passed quickly enough. Besides, Bob said that to everyone, even the old lady who'd pushed a stroller past with a hissing cat inside. Bob was perfect. Every day was perfect. She was perfectly happy. She'd asked Bob to grab her some toilet paper one day, and she hadn't even bothered to cover herself when he stepped in and handed it to her. He laughed when she mentioned it. It's like we're an old married couple. She hadn't realized she was sighing so much, but Bob asked her about it, noting the exact number of sighs for the week, up 38%. Lucy said, There's nothing wrong, Bob. I'm fine. Take off your pants. But he knew something was bothering her. He surprised her after work with a bouquet of flowers, then whisked her off to a romantic dinner. Afterward, he was very mysterious when asked where they were going next. He said, You'll see. As she took off the blindfold, she had to admit the view was spectacular at the top of the Empire State Building, though it looked a little stormy. She'd known that's where they were, of course. The tour guide wouldn't shut up about it. But she hadn't wanted to spoil Bob's reveal. Lucy had been to the Empire State Building years before, when she'd first moved to New York. She and her date had been wasted on Jägermeister and Peach Snops when he'd pulled out a roll of pennies and told her, I'm gonna kill all those fuckers down there. But he'd just cried hysterically, then vomited in her purse. When Bob kissed her, the feeling was electric. Just like the first time, her body tingled like it was on fire. When Lucy woke in the hospital, a snarky nurse told her, Your big robo-dildo got torched by lightning, but he saved your life. The woman who answered the phone at Robo Refurbs was very understanding and thought they'd be able to download Bob's cerebral core into another chassis right away. When Lucy heard the knock at the door, she ran and flung it open. Bob stood there, and she kissed him hard. Take off your pants and go to the bedroom. Bob scratched his chin. Well, okay, but could we grab a bite later? I'm starving. Lucy took a step backward, and he held out his hand. I'm Bob Rosardo, the owner of Robo Refurbs. I'm really sorry, but we had a server failure and we're unable to recover the data from your unit. We'll get another bot set up for you right away with the deluxe upgrades on us. We just need you to redo your profile. He pulled out a clipboard and flipped through some invoices. He said, Oh, I get it. Sorry, Ms. Lancaster. You had a Bob unit. Yeah, my friends were always ribbing me about doing that personality profile thing for the doc. Hey, Bob, saw you at the game today. Hey, Bob, saw you dancing with a dude today. That kind of thing. I should have said something sooner. Lucy felt a lump grow in her throat, and she turned away. Bob asked, Ms. Lancaster, do you still want to go grab a bite? I know this Italian place nearby that's pretty good. Lucy turned to face him. Bob, do you like Hitchcock movies? He shrugged. They're okay, I guess. I mean, the ones I've seen have been pretty good. Lucy stood for a moment, then said, Sure, Bob. Let's go. Just let me grab my coat. And call me Lucy. Author's Note The question is a blend of a sci-fi romance story I outlined 20 years ago, uh, then shelved in shame, and an homage of a 10-second robot chicken gag I expanded significantly. I had a blast writing this. Twice. I retooled the story from its original form, streamlining certain areas and tweaking some other parts. I remembered thinking this story could really use an ostrich. Say what? When I write, I like to daydream ideas in my mind. 
working out scenes as I go. When I wrote this piece, I remember doing chores around the house and having to drop everything and run to the keyboard to jot down something that struck me as funny. Lots of things strike me as funny. I like to add a little bit of humor to almost everything I write. And this story is one of my favorites. Uh, big, big. After the story, why mm-hmm. don't you tell me who did voices in the episode? Okay. And is this a record for us? Probably. This is the the all-star episode, right? Or, well, you could call it that. I, I, Night of a Thousand Stars. Yeah, I, I did this at the last freaking minute, of course. So I just emailed everybody I could think of uh, off the top of my head really fast. Uh, let's see, I could get this person to do this one, this one, uh, and I was just... Th- like eight minutes before the episode was set to air. <laughs> right, right, I was just throwing it out. So, um, the one person uh, who hasn't been on our show before, um, who played our main character, Lucy Lancaster, was Kim Price from the Ladies of Leet podcast. Wait, what is Leet? Elite? I believe, I believe it is short for Elite. Okay. I think it's one of those gamer little slang things that they do. I'm not really sure, though, because I'm not a gamer, so I don't know. Did, what, d- didn't you play Legend of Zelda in high school? <laughs> oh, someday I'll tell you what I was doing in high school. Okay, so she uh, provided her voice for us. She did provide her voice. She was the voice of our main Reason. character, Lucy Lancaster. And then there was... Jeez, it seemed like dozens. I don't know. There was a, a one-liner thrown in for... Dozens of characters here, there, and everywhere. And I'm just going to list off who provided these lines. I'm not going to try and assign them all to characters because there's too many. We had <clears throat> one-liners provided by Joe Zija, Damon Shaw, Amory Lowe, Scott Pig, Amanda Crum, Julie Hoverson, Brian Lincoln, Marshall Latham, Clay Duggar, Josh Roseman. So anyways, yes, all those characters were played by those folks. Uh, the, thank you for sending those in, and it's such short notes. Yes, thank you so much. I, 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 you know, of course I wasted all that. You know, I had it all planned out. I had those lines from, from the minute that we recorded the story. I highlighted all the lines that needed to be done. And then a month later. Yeah, a month later, I finally asked somebody to read them for us. So thank you guys so much for uh, being so quick and getting those out to me right away. Um, other than that, I was the narrator. Uh, Rish Outfield played the uh, smooth and dashing Bob, the robot, as well as the later incarnation of Bob, the live human being. I think his name was Bob Rizzardo. Um, and he was also the crazy scientist man, Doc Z. Zachariah Zorpinski. You are. No, you. It was you. So that's our cast list. So thank you also to Robert Louis Stevenson for (laughs) teaching us that a man could have a dark side within him. He could appear to be an upstanding Englishman, but actually... Okay, and in in addition, uh, thank you, Robert Lowell Russell, for sending us that story. This was his first published work... It was his first published work elsewhere. We're republishing it. Okay. So, but that's fine, right? Yeah. What do you think is not fine? Most of our stories are republished. Oh, look in the box. There's no grapes. There's no nuts. What is up with that? No pants. No pants. I'm sorry. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> we will try and make this episode decidedly less silly, starting now. I, I, Excuse me, I soiled myself. That's all right, we all do that here, Bruce. Uh, we are closed for submissions, but when we open for submissions again, yeah, it will be cool to have more stories by Robert, Robert Louis, Louis Stevenson. Stevenson. Yeah, that would be nice. And maybe Robert Lowell Russell, too. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, what made you decide this particular episode for this particular week? That was really not my decision when it comes down to it. I think that was your suggestion way back when we first took the story to do. You said, oh, I love this story. And oh, you know what? Maybe we should run this as our Valentine's Day story. I wouldn't say that. Oh, you wouldn't. That's true. When I saw that suggestion, I thought, oh, that's perfect. This would be perfect. And so 
Yeah. Okay, now what really happened? Because that was you it? never would say that would be perfect when I say, can we run the can you f it story <laughs> on Valentine's Day? It was perfect. I just thought, wow, that's exactly, uh, because not only is it a can you f it story, you know, there's a hopeful love story involved in it. It's not just, yeah, can you f it? How many times can you f it? Can you f it from behind hey, too? Hey, hey. <laughs> if you say that one more time, we're going to have to put an explicit warning on this show and i wouldn't want to do that yeah we wouldn't want to do that i'll stop i'm sorry thank you i'll say can you bleep it okay i think that's acceptable okay good anyhow i don't remember volunteering that this should be a valentine's day episode but it does turn out kind of sweet Mm -hmm. and there is a kind of romance I, i i don't know i just found it so funny from beginning to end that i and and you know what last episode was really funny too so it's funny that we would do two funny episodes in a row, but it, it is just, funny that we would do funny. Uh, okay, look, I don't I speak English good. I think you're overusing good. that word. Okay. Uh, to me, I laughed out loud when the doctor, the mad doctor, I was at Burger King. Where, <laughs> see, let me give you a glimpse behind the curtain. For the stories that the slush readers really like, Sudden Death Nicole, who is our submissions editor, will send those stories to Big and he will print them out and give me a copy and give himself a copy, right? No, you're close, but not quite. Okay. She will send the stories to Fat, and Fat will. <laughs> it's gave, big and fat these days. He gave me a copy of the story, and I took it to Burger King. I like to read these on my lunch break sometimes. And when I got to the part where he said, ask the question, and they asked it, and he goes, Yes! I laughed. I wanted to do the story for that part alone, (laughs) for his triumphant yes, or it's yes, you can, or however it was. And I probably woke your entire family doing that part. But just, oh, to to be able to do a mad scientist voice was just so much fun. And do you remember what I told you to model your uh, mad scientist voice after when we were doing it? I don't. (laughs) Those who get to listen to the outtakes will probably get to hear it. But uh, we were trying to think of how to do it. And then I said, think Eastern European. And you're like, I was like, what? I I said, okay, pretend like you're Balki (laughs) Bartakamus. Really? I did an accent? (laughs) And from there on, it was, I don't know how close to Balki Bartakamus that is, but who cares? It was Zachariah Zorpinski anyways. Oh, that's funny. I love to do the silly voices. So what's kept us from a Parsec Award, apparently. <laughs> Bang, zoom. Um, we have done our share of romantic stories on the show. We did the one where the guy falls in love with the ghost of the dead girl in a motel room. We did the one with the, uh, it was a Scottish right. locale. And she was a... Like a transsexual God. she was a she was a goddess that came down to live among men or something like that uh, yeah that was a good one we did the time travel 1984 episode which was also romantic mm-hmm. ish did we the did, club stories count as romance yeah those were i was gonna say we did the one where the uh, agents of chemo go into a zombie infested prison and kill all the zombies but uh club will work okay all right Lonely Hearts Club can't be anything but romantic. We haven't done a lot of just stock romance kind of things. I guess that's not really our forte anyway. I mean, we like speculative fiction. We like comedic stuff. We like scary stuff, that sort of thing. But, you know, it's surprising since one of us is completely... um, Unlovable? All right, that'll do. That we would do romantic stories or love stories on the show, but... uh, you know what? Even, even, even Stevens. Every dog has his day. I don't know. There, there is some kind of saying I was trying to go to some romantic. You know, even only Nixon could go to China. Even a man who's pure at heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. Okay. No, not that no, one. Either. I'm starting to understand where you're going with this. I don't know. You know, way back when, when I first started listening to podcasts, 
the first show that I listened to faithfully Lake was... Lake Wobegon Tales, the yeah, Garrison Yeah, that's Taylor. really the only one I ever listened to. I don't even listen to our show because it Garrison sucks Taylor. compared to uh, the Perry Home Companion. Prairie, but, that's what it's called, Perry Home But uh, I also once listened to the show called Escape Pod, and they did various sci-fi stories. And then at one point, it was a Valentine's episode that he did, and he did this story where he was... Involved. Where a woman had sex with a broken shovel handle. <laughs> Luckily, no, it wasn't that one. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll cut that out. That's awful, dude. <laughs> she did, though. She did. Holy crow, man. Imagine the splinters. I shat my seat, and I was at work when I heard that. <laughs> he did one where there was a uh, romance involved, and then afterwards, Steve Ely was talking about how he felt kind of sad that most science fiction love story or romance isn't an integral part of the story he said the only uh, good example that he could think of was the time traveler's wife as a story where the romance and the love story was an integral part i don't know if that's true it seems to me like you just listed off several stories that we've run that are all speculative fiction stories in one way or another and they all involved that it was all a very important part and Klob has to get our sad, backward, little, pent-up Englishman to ask that hot girl out. I don't know. Maybe I don't see it. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it's an important part of sci-fi, fantasy, horror? I guess in horror, it's probably not a big important part. But It may be that they feel like it gets in the way of the ideas that they're trying to put forth. Maybe that romance is something that's banal and, and earthbound, at least, you know, for as far as like science fiction writers of the past have gone. Well, I, I think it'd be fair to say that, you know, in a movie like Avatar, the love story was the backbone of that flick. Mm-hmm. But those are few and far between if you think of how many space faring movies there are. And I'm sorry that I'm mentioning movies instead of stories or books, <laughs> but that's all. But I you know. don't read books. I've never so. read a book. No. But perhaps because science fiction movies tend to either be science fiction action movies right. or science fiction horror movies that they feel like, well, that's where we need to focus our movie. Um, and, we, and we don't want the, the kissing to get in the way. All that. Although action movies can, almost can always help? include kissing although it's usually somewhat forced but uh yeah every action movie has to have the girl that you win by way of your action hero feats i hear you but how about science fiction movies can you help me out can you name a few name a few science fiction movies that in general that have romance in them oh that have romance in them because i mean if you said something like starship troopers that romance isn't it's not in the heinlein book and if you look at the verhoven movie the romance is really, really incidental to the film as well. You know, it's just the port in the storm that the character happens to find, right? Yeah, although, to tell you the truth, I don't remember. Oh, I think I may have blocked. Bad example. I may have blocked that movie out of my mind for the most part. Oh, well, okay, if you look in at Aliens, the only one of the four Alien... Oh, geez, there's six now. Alien movies with romance in it. Cameron cut all that romance stuff for the theatrical version. Mostly... Ah, you see what he did there, folks? Uh, there, there's our Parsec nomination right there. You're down the tube because of that. Oh, I know. No, no, no. <laughs> I meant that that made up for my silly voices. but Yeah, I don't know. Like you said, there's Avatar, uh, which is very much a sci-fi movie. If we go back, I'm trying to think of movies recently that were uh, sci-fi. There was that uh, one where they make the creature splice splice that's it you saw, did you see i splice? didn't see that but you told me about it and wasn't at least sex was a part of it right because the guy man evil man has to have sex with the thing but uh, no that's funny that you mentioned splice because it i'm just trying to think of recent a, movies. there is a resounding overtone of can you fit <laughs> in splice and it's almost a cautionary tale in a way of you know, he shouldn't have left it. He, he he focused so much on whether he could. He he didn't stop to, to ask himself if he should. <laughs> and I would be interested to know if people really like that movie. Sometimes there are movies that appeal more to guys. And, and I know we talk about that on That Gets My Goat all the time. And there are movies that appeal more to girls than ladies. 
Women. The, 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 the people All the ladies I know in the house about. tonight, let me hear you say. Oh, that was too soon, <laughs> which apparently is a problem for me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I gotta, I, I gotta incur the wrath of people that are offended by things like this. I think from the first moment we saw Drell or whatever her name was in, in Splice, that's where my mind went. I mean, part of it was the choice of how alien to make her. Mm-hmm. Because she's pretty animalistic, alien-y, but she's played by a model-type actress, Mm -hmm. and she still looks feminine and all that. You know, they did what they could to keep that in your mind of, you know, if you were Adrian Brody, would you kind of thing? (laughs) And so I think this story, it certainly strikes a nerve with me. I, I don't know. I'll be the bad guy. I'll just come out and say it. If there were humanoid robots... Probably the first question anybody would ask is, is there a chance that these will destroy us? And the second question is, what would it feel like to have sex with it? I think that that's just natural. Yeah, it's not the first time something like that has come up. I mean, there's great movies like Cherry 2000. Is it 2000? 3000? Maybe it is 3000. I think it's 2000. It was some factor of (laughs) 1000. You know, and there's been tons of movies where there's the robot play things like that can you f it type uh, robots you know the one thing that i thought was interesting about this whole thing is that the stuff that he mentions in the story where all of a sudden birth rates are way down all those kind of things and people stop having romances with other people because other people aren't like the robots they don't do everything that we want them to do and automatically calculate what is the best move you know the best thing the thing that will be the most productive correct for the relationship to make it work real people don't do that so why would you go through all that suffering of a real relationship when you could have this other one and you get all the stuff except for children in a continuing human race real relationships lead to suffering (laughs) that's right but i don't know i mean i think when it comes down to it, it it's kind of a natural thing there are non-humanoid things that people will use in that you way. You say the bleep word? They will already bleep these non-humanoid things. There's all sorts of things. If you go to an adult novelty store oh, that you okay. can find. Sure. And the term robo-dildo this is not coined just for this story. It's something I think that already existed. Well, since this is the Valentine's Day episode, and since I've already offended Half our <laughs> listeners. Um, You're going to offend the I, other half now? Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Now, you're a good-looking guy, and you tended to have good experiences with romance. When you were growing up, when you were a teenager, when you were 20, whatever it was, did you ever want to throw up your hands and say, this is just too hard? This is too much work. Why does it have to be so difficult? To the point where you would say... Oh, there's a robot where all I have to do is flip a switch and everything works out great? (laughs) I don't think so. But in those days, it was less work than it is as time goes by. You know what I mean? No. Like when you're a teenager, everybody, that's just what you want to do. You know what I mean? Girls want to do that. Guys want to do that. That's all you're thinking about. Uh, When you first hit puberty, all of a sudden, it's just like your glands go, Here, have some hormones. And they just start shoveling them into your bloodstream. Go, go, go. It's like the guy running the steam engine or something. Iceberg, dead ahead. (laughs) Oh, wait, that was before that. (laughs) It's like, oh, John Henry was a steel driving man. He He was. He wasn't a shoveler of coal, was he? There wasn't like a tall tale guy that was a coal shoveler that could make the train go faster than anybody. Anyways, if there were a tall tale where the guy was like John Henry and could just shovel that coal into that train. Coal shoveling steel. Steve. There we go. Uh, Cole Shovelin Steve, the tall tail shoveler. It's like that guy gets released into your freaking pituitary gland or whichever gland it is that gives you the hormones that you go nuts with. But that's what it's like when you're a teenager, man. Everybody wants to do that. And so it's so much less difficult. Although I, I, there are some of those, you know, drama things going on because yeah, the, a lot of those hormones cause you to also freak out at littlest things but you lose one girlfriend and 
all the other girls also are interested, if you know what I'm saying. Because it's new to everybody. But at a certain point, it becomes older and older hat. And uh, then I think it takes much more work for things to work, if you know what I'm saying. And then it's more easy to just want to throw up your hands and say, okay, as you mentioned, just you could just flip a switch. On Facebook, there was this thing that I saw going around. It was one of, you know, there's everybody's got to attach a picture. So this picture, there's two machines, one on top and one on the bottom. And the one on the top is labeled man. The one on the bottom is labeled woman. And the machine on the top is man, and it has an on-off switch. And that's the only control on the entire panel. And then the woman panel has got like 25 different knobs and switches and dials. <laughs> Sometimes that's true. It's just like, oh, what does it take to not say something stupid that's going to cause more problems? Oh, gosh, I turned the knob the wrong way again kind of a thing and then you're like you went through all 15 knobs correctly and then the very last one well you turned that the wrong way crap now you got to start over true that i don't like to say true that but okay i'll say the other i will say true that (laughs) that's totally true but you know in defense of ladies i spent a lot of my 20s in california and I would sometimes go to the clubs, the, the nightclubs, the singles bar places, wherever it was with friends or coworkers. And you would look at these guys and that's what they would do every, geez, it might have been every night, but at least every Friday and Saturday night. Mm-hmm. They would go and they would look for women and it would be like the hyenas or the lions <laughs> looking for the weak gazelle, uh-huh. looking for whatever antelope was was tired or in this case you know inebriated or <laughs> looked lonely or whatever and they would circle and it was i don't know it depressed me when i would see this right because these guys they they became feral or whatever and it became a there was no romance involved right. it was a competition of uh, some kind of masculine competition of like wh- who can I grab and have my way with and toss aside and maybe I can still salvage the rest of the night and find another one. Yeah, and there you go. It, it used to bum me out. I would I would freak out, and I, I don't mean to say that men are are absolute bleeps, <laughs> but you'd see that, and I felt a they make all of us look bad. These right. guys. But it also makes it hard for those of us who are actually looking for romance or or looking for something more deep than Mm -hmm. just that. It made it all the more difficult. Uh, Yeah, oftentimes it would be just a throw your hands in the air kind of moment where I just like, well, if this is what it is, I would love to just be able to go home and flip the switch on something. Somebody that would understand me, somebody that would care what I had to say and who I was inside kind of thing even if that thing was melanie griffith a robot like, melanie griffith that was like really empty was headed once wasn't she I, she was attractive but she was twice as empty headed as a robot oh, as she is in real life point. yeah and so i can totally understand and, and not even uh, taking the whole singles bar out of the equation i can understand somebody being drawn to this simple solution and taking all the complexity out of the dating game or, or the search for love mm-hmm. and all that. And, and you know what? Maybe a real living, breathing partner is more rewarding, ultimately is better, but it's certainly not easier. And right. so sometimes, you know, the easy th- solution is what you're looking for. And, you know, I, I, in case I sounded too sensitive there <laughs> with talking about the girls and the, the scumbag guys – there were lots of girls that they were going for that reason to go get hit on and be picked up on, allow myself to get drunk, to lower my inhibitions. And whoever happens to come up to me at the right time is who I get to be with. And I'm not saying that that's bad, but when I would look around at some of these really aggressive guys, the the, the feral ones I just described, they were almost animalistic of it. You know, like, like throwing a piece of meat into a pen and whoever leaps on it gets it and snarls and pushes the others away. It's the whole alpha male kind of thing. And you know, there, there would be times where it was like, that's what you want is the one who snarls the loudest, who <laughs> leaps the hardest, who pushes the other guys out of the way first. 
So that's daunting. That's really awful. And, 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 and you know, you're fortunate in a way that you don't have to go through any of that crap. And, and you know what? Maybe you would have been one of the snarling feral guys, but I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, what, what you wanted was to go with a bunch of like-minded people who would watch your back and would help you and be there for you and say, oh, hey, at least you tried. You know, she wouldn't let you buy her a drink. But, you know, that's okay. You'll you'll find, you'll do better. You know, it's like, oh, that she doesn't know what she's missing out on kind of thing. The, just a, a sense of belonging and community. And mm-hmm. it's something I think everybody wants. Right. Not too long ago, somebody gave me this book. It was about making your marriage work or whatever kind of a book. And uh, I read it and I, there were some really interesting concepts in there. I think it was called Real Love. Just all about what people are after in life is real love, which is like unconditional love. You know, somebody loves you even when you do the wrong thing, even when you screw up. And when you screw up and somebody shows their displeasure in the fact that you screwed up, then suddenly you realize, oh, they don't love me unconditionally. They only love me if I do what's right. And so a lot of people never get that real love thing that you're talking about, you know, that sense of belonging and that feeling of you know, being a part of everybody else. And so they search for what they call imitation love to fill that void, that emptiness that's inside them because they don't have the real love. And yeah, a lot of these kind of things, you know, he lists them out and it's been a while since I read the book, so I can't remember what they all are, but things like compliments or pleasure, you know, that kind of stuff is the kind of things that will make you feel good for a little bit and it'll fill that emptiness for a little bit until, you know, the next time. And sometimes it's a sense of power that will make you feel okay. And so that's why people wind up yelling at each other or trying to put each other down, et cetera, et cetera. It was really an interesting thing. Would you indulge me in, uh, in, in letting me tell the story of the best experience that I had with that going to the club's time in Los Angeles. You can tell us a good experience if you'd like. I I tend to focus on the negative and the fun of let's make fun of Rish on this show just because it's, uh, it's a defense mechanism. But there was this time when I was, oh, geez, I'm going to use an old school word, wooing the best friend of my friend's girlfriend, let's say. And we. Jesse's girl? <laughs> no, Jesse's girl used to be my girl, and now she, he's Jesse's girl, right? No, no, no. Jesse's girl was always. Jesse's it's girl. It's my best friend's girl that used to yeah. be mine. Jesse's girl had nothing Jesse's to do with Jesse's got a anything. girl that he wants to make mine. Right. <laughs> Sorry. He's holding her in his arms. She's loving him with that body. He just knows it. What does all this have to do with anything? <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. I, I really no. got us off track, didn't no. I? Now I'm depressed. Jesse is a friend. Okay. So my friend had a girl that he was dating on and off, and she had a best friend that I was really attracted to. And every once in a while, I would see her, and I felt like there was some kind of connection, and it was, but it was impossible to know because it was on again. The next time, the connection was not there. But one night... The stars aligned. Uh, And and everything seemed to be going wonderfully. And she and I hit it off. And we were in some club right off of Sunset Boulevard. And we were sitting together at some booth. And edited for television. Things went extremely well. Yeah, I was I was flying high, as that awful song goes. And at one point, she got up to go get a drink, or she got up to go to the bathroom. And, and I was left alone at this booth. And I, let's see if I can even get through this story. A second later, this kid came up to me. This, this geeky guy in his 20s or something, he came up to me. And he says, hey, you don't know me, but I've been over there in that booth with my friends, and we've been watching you with that girl and I want to shake your hand <laughs> and I, I at first I thought he was just screwing around but he shook my hand and I looked over and one of the guys lifted a drink and, and he had the waitress buy me a drink and I was just like what is this for and he said for showing us that it can be done 
And I was blown away. And he turned around <laughs> and he went away. And I, I didn't see these guys again for the night. But holy crap, that was such an awesome moment that I was inspiring to these guys. That a normal geeky loser kid was hitting it off with a girl, an attractive girl. And that it inspired them. It just made me feel like I was important, like I was a big Anklevich, you know? I was somebody. <laughs> and And you looked closer at the table and it was like Ashton Kutcher and... Charlie Sheen and Justin Timberlake and uh, Usher and Steve Buscemi over there at the, the table. The great sexy man. Yeah, yeah. The, the modern day Rat Pack. Wow. And they were like, wow, you showed me that I can do it too. <laughs> Anyhow, that I, I, the experience with the girl was really great. But the thing with the geeky guys has stuck with me longer and it, it's just it's something that I I don't know what the guy's intention was when he came over but I choose to believe that it was the purest of intentions that's how I have retold the story just now and I used that in a story I wrote as just like an awesome awesome thing that happens to the main character before it all goes to hell <laughs> and it that kind of thing is just one of those where you know it's like okay I wish I could do that and not come off as a dip shit, oh, a, a dip bleep. It, it just anyway, that's the story I wanted to share. It being Valentine's Day and all. Is it Valentine's Day? Oh, did it's we miss it? Valentine season. All right. you, uh... <laughs> Valentine is the reason for the season. <laughs> what? <laughs> I think it's got something to do with Rudolph Valentino. Oh, is that right? He was a famous silent film star. Yes, and he was a saint, Valentino. Or maybe he was... Uh, these things I did not know. San Valentino? I'm not sure how the Italian goes. That's the one of those languages I haven't the slightest clue really about what the words are that they use. Well, before we fill people's heads with more nonsense, maybe we should uh, call it a night. I think Rish is right. Inconceivable. Uh, we could. There's a couple other things I wanted to hit on. Talking about you being this inspiring uh, studly man in the bar and then i woke up <laughs> and i had crapped the bed that's right and sadly that girl from the bar was in the bed with you oh. in the crap oh. you know how horrible that would be <laughs> that's that's almost as bad as my life that the thought <laughs> almost that. almost oh so anyways yeah uh, it's interesting today's art for the story today was done by lisa wilde Oh, right. But she's done a lot of stuff for us. Yeah, she's done several uh, bits of art for us recently. She did uh, Rain's art and she did Beachcombing's art, which was uh, really cool. Loved it was it a lot. real art. It wasn't just yeah. like Photoshop stuff. Yeah, it was actual art, which we actually steer clear of because, because it's work. <laughs> she volunteered for us to do that once a while back and uh, she's all into it and stuff she likes doing the art thing and just recently she was talking about the whole inspiration thing uh there was a time where we talked a little bit about that on the show we came up or i don't know if we came up with this phrase or if it was just something we'd already talked about before but the phrase why not oh that's my theme for 2012 yeah the theme of why not don't say why but say why not and do it she just wanted to let us know about something that had happened in her life that kind of ties back into this. Her friend got this email about this huge design agency that was looking for illustrators to fill out this charity art show that was going on in town. Like in a gallery or something? Yeah, in their gallery. And the stipulation was that you had to be a published illustrator to get into this uh, art show. Normally, she would have gone, oh, crap. But instead, she went, hey, I've had my art published on the Doonstief site. It's not just put up on my own little website. This was published on a magazine. And so she applied. And she got in. She says it's the first time there's been such a large group of internationally published illustrators in her town. And these illustrators are award-winning illustrators. It's like the people whose illustrations are being published in like New York Times magazine and stuff. And right there, sharing wall space with them is a piece by Lisa Wilde. She says, 
I know you guys always talk about a fear of submitting your work, but you never know what can happen if you just put yourself out there. Why not? Thanks for helping me say that, yes, I am a published illustrator. I thought that was really inspiring, personally, to hear that. Uh, like you were the inspiration to those nerdy dudes in the restaurant. Or maybe they weren't. They, it was Justin Timberlake and Usher, after all. <laughs> but uh, you take your inspiration wherever you can get it, and you go with it. Whatever your goal is, if it be to get that girl or if it be to get that spot on the wall next to the great illustrators uh, i don't know where lisa wilde's going but judging from the art that she's submitted to us she's going places it's lovely stuff every time i see it i just think man this is this is too good for our show it's like attaching a big old helium balloon to anything that we make it lifts it up where it could never be otherwise it makes our show look legitimate. So, yeah, you just got to put the work in and go for it. And you can go places if you want to go places. It's all up to you. You just got to tell yourself why not, I guess. Well, hey, thank you for sharing that story with me. I don't know that I had anything to do with that, but wow, that's, that's cool. And, and that's exactly what I meant by why not. As you know, there are a million doubts and a million reservations that somebody can have about every prospect and wherever you can get inspiration to just put all of that crap behind you and say I'm going to do it anyway you know then that inspiration is is good thank you for coming along and you know if one of those dudes that night scored <laughs> uh, you know how great that is I, I <laughs> sorry the Usher and Leonardo DiCaprio and yeah that would be amazing right I mean wow <laughs> sorry okay that that was all terrible then the inspiration is all you need. I mean, really, I think most of us know what needs to be done, what they need to change in their lives or what they need to focus on. And that, and they just, that you just need a breeze to blow you in that direction or, or a tiny push. You know what I mean? You just need the road ahead to be a slight bit downhill and then you can make it happen. And, 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 and I don't know. I'm the worst person ever to give advice. But just the, the why not thing, it is a simple question to ask yourself. And if that's all you need, then you can make it happen. I think, thank you for sharing that story. I, I got nothing, man. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot for that, Lisa. When the uh, email first came in, I just thought, wow, that's really great. That's something that we've got to share on the show. Because that's one of those things that we're kind of driving at. Like you said, it's your theme for 2012. Why not do the thing that you love? There's no reason not to. Go for it. But we've already got one inspiring story to go along with it. Who knows what can happen this year? Why not give it a shot? It makes me wish our submissions were open. Because <laughs> I could say, send us a story. If you're, that you're, you're afraid to share it with somebody, share it with us. But... So this is just a shame that That's... we don't do that. But share it with somebody else. Send yeah. a freaking Drabblecast. Share this it with... how high my voice has gotten. <laughs> no buttons! <laughs> there are places that have open submissions. Send it to them. Nobody can say yes unless you give them a chance to say yes. You never win a race that you don't enter. So give it a shot. Ask that chick out. Ask that dude out. Ask them both out. Whatever your thing is, go for it. Why not? That's good stuff, man. All right. I've been Big Anklevich. I've been Rashad Field. Thanks for listening. All the way to the end. And why not, folks? Ah. Bye. Looks like we're out of time. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Goodbye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. Take two. Uh, this is episode 124, right? Is it really? It seems like weeks ago we did 123.
weeks ago. It was weeks ago, and I just released it two days ago. You also just released a fart. I just released something squishy into my pants. <laughs>